event include Asylum Access Thailand, the Asia Pacific Refugee Rights Network, the Center for Asylum Protection, Equal Asia Foundation, Fortify Rights, Host International, International Detention Coalition, Jesuit Refugee Services, and the Refugee Rights Litigation Project. So, yeah. All right. So we'll start panel discussion at 7. And in the meantime, I hope you will enjoy yourselves with some of the exhibition we have today. We have a simulation of the uh, Immigration Detention Center cell room. I'm not sure if you had a chance to see when you walk in in the beginning. So for some of the people that we work with, they actually have lived experience in the detention centers before. So uh, they describe to us what it felt like to be in IDC, things they notice, things they remember, cell room simulation. So that's something you could uh, yeah, try, try out. And there's also a little seat that you can sit in in the simulation so you can understand uh, the amount of space there is allocated for overcrowded, especially during the pandemic times because uh, in, in a lot of detention centers there was no uh, bills allowed during the COVID times. So, and apart from the cell room simulation, we also have art exhibition out front uh, by members of, of our refugee community who has been in detention before. So a lot of these art pieces that you might see when you step out the, out of the elevator, uh, they're, they're made by, by people who people who spent time in IDC as well. And yeah, they, we reached out to a few of the communities. A lot of people would prefer not to discuss their experience in detention, of course. But a lot of others also like, want to share more about the things they've experienced. So s a lot of them uh, submitted things they wanted to share and messages they have uh, for the public eye to see. And apart from that, we also have uh, some arts and crafts from Chamalin and from Hope. Uh, they're handicraft products made by the refugee community. Okay, so yeah, please enjoy yourselves and yeah, take this chance to learn more about our exhibitions. All right. Hello again, everyone. Good evening. And I would like to take this chance to formally welcome everyone to the CRSP World Refugee Day event under the title of Stop Arbitrary Detention of Refugees, making this a reality under the new Thai government. So right now, I'd like to invite and introduce each of the five speakers that we have for today joining our panel discussion. First, I would like you to welcome Ms. Mr. Kanawi Soup Sang, the Secretary General of Fair Party or Pen Tham Party. Mr. Kanawi has a background in, at the National Security Council and later joined the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, serving in eight countries, in, including South Sudan, Uganda, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand. 
Kun Kanawi has expertise in humanitarian response, specifically in the war-affected Thai-Myanmar border area, where he has provided emergency support to internally displaced people and refugees. Secondly, I would like to invite Ms. Pia Oberoi. Ms. Pia is the Senior Advisor on Migration and Human Rights for the Asia-Pacific region, based on, in, the human, in the United Nations Human Rights Office in Bangkok, Thailand. Before this, Pia was the head of the global migration team at the OHCHR and has led the migrants' rights work of Amnesty International's International Secretariat. She's also an expert consultant for NGOs and policy think tanks around the world and has published and lectured extensively on migration and human rights issues. Thirdly, I'd like to welcome Ms. Yuhani Zeka. Ms. Yuhani is the regional manager of Host International. She currently leads Host Thailand's office in international protection, child protection, and alternative to detention in Thailand. As a human rights lawyer, Ms. Yuhani assists urban refugees and asylum seekers in Thailand to obtain their refugee status and relocation to a third country according to the RSD process. She also gave legal assistance on human rights abuses and immigration detention cases based on the Refugee Convention and Thai laws. She has previously worked with refugees along the Thai-Burmese border and has previously assisted human rights cases in the deep south of Thailand where national security laws were imposed. Fourthly, we have Mr. Shawarat Shawarangun. Mr. Shawarat is the Southeast Asia Program Manager at the International Detention Coalition. Mr. Shawarat has experiences in humanitarian, human rights, and development across Asia and Africa. He advocated for protection of the rights of marginalized groups, building resilient communities, and sustainable development environment for vulnerable groups. He has also facilitated the development of Thailand's policy to end the immigration detention of children, as well as the national screening mechanism in Thailand. And lastly, but most importantly, we are truly honored to welcome a sp guest speaker who has spent five years of lived experience in one of Thailand's immigration detention center. But due to privacy and security reasons, this uh, guest speaker will Would you like to say hi. I guess not yet, but she'll join soon. <laughs> and um, if you don't mind a little int self-introduction, my name is Prima Sukmanop. I'm currently a legal officer at Th Asylum Access Thailand. So I work with asylum seekers and refugees in their refugee status determination, as well as policy advocacy for implement implementation of the new national screening mechanism for refugees in Thailand. So the theme of today's event is about immigration detention, particularly about arbitrary detention of refugees and asylum seekers. And our recommendations to the new Thai government as well as to what we expect them to do in the future. There will be a 15 minute room for, Q for Q and A in between the panel discussion session and the recommendations. So if you have any questions or things you would like to discuss further in this uh, session, please uh, save your questions during those 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, before we go ahead and uh, move on into the, in, uh, to the discussion, let's take a moment to lay down the context of why we are here today on World Refugee Day in the first place. So yeah, let's go back to the principle and first discuss what it means to be a refugee and what it means to be an asylum seeker as well. So under the 1951 Refugee Convention, uh, a refugee is per a person who is outside of their country of origin and is unwilling or unable to return to that country of origin due to a well-founded fear of being persecuted. The grounds for persecution must be based on at least one of the five following grounds, which include race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership of a particular social group. An asylum seeker, on the other hand, is a person who has left their country of nationality and is seeking international protection from persecution in another country. Asylum seekers are in process of waiting to receive a decision on their asylum claim and have not yet been legally recognized as a refugee. 
So legally speaking, a refugee is someone who is legally recognized as a refugee. However, in a general sense, like in the context of our discussion today, when we refer to the term refugee, this would generally include both asylum seekers and refugees, as we are discussing the group of people who have fled their country of origin to flee from persecution or other forms of serious human rights violation. So next up, you may have a question of why we are discussing arbitrary detention on World Refugee Day. So we should, before we start off with the panel discussion, we should recognize that Thailand is currently not a party to the Refugee Convention. This means that Thailand does not have an asylum law, and the main source of law that dictates the influx of aliens coming into Thailand would be the immigration law, particularly the Immigration Act. Now, uh, Thailand's immigration law does not recognize nor distinguish between illegal aliens and people who come into Thailand because they are fleeing harm or danger from persecution or other forms of serious human rights violation. This means that individuals without valid documentation or visa, for whatever reason, may be subject to criminal charges under Thailand's immigration law and would therefore be subject to arrest and detention while de their deportation or resettlement is being processed. However, refugees cannot be deported because they will very, very likely face serious human rights violation in their country of origin. Yet at the same time, resettlement is an extremely lengthy and limited process that only less than 1% of refugees are resettled each year. So as many people would say, refugees in Thailand are in a situation of where they are stuck in limbo. They don't have legal status in Thailand. They are subject to blanket criminalization under immigration laws. They cannot integrate with local societies but at the same time, it's also very difficult for them to go anywhere else or have another chance at life. So a lot of us here, me included, we have the privilege of never, never having to go through tra interviews that would re-traumatize us of the worst memories we've ever experienced, uh, lengthy immigration procedures, or even arbitrary arrest and detention in, in order to eventually access basic rights. But of course, at this moment, may I please invite our anonymous speaker to share about her own experience in an, Im in an immigration detention center here in Thailand. Hello, Ms. Guest Speaker, are you with us in the session now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, can, I, can you turn the audio off, please? Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening, Ms. Guest Speaker. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to, to talk to you and have you join our uh, session remotely. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Okay, so uh, Ms. Speaker, could you please briefly tell me about your background and particularly why did you decide to flee your country of origin? Okay, I came with my family when I was 18 years old and I fled from Pakistan because of persecution, because uh, the Pakistan is the country where we are minorities. So we fled from Pakistan to save our lives. And I was arrested and detained at, at the age of 21 and spent five years in IDC. Uh, could you and please? Though, yep. Yes. Yeah, could you please tell me, tell us a little bit more of what it's like to be in the IDC and your personal experiences, what you think, uh, what you remember from it? Yeah. Like, uh, life in IDC is very difficult because those five years, I think I cannot forget even I, if I wanted to because I cannot see the sun, cannot see the moon, cannot feel the fresh air, I cannot talk to my family. And even I was not able to see them for like so long because I have to wait for my visit that when someone come to visit me, when my parents will come to visit me and they will see me because I think the visiting procedure is, uh, was very complicated for me because the visitor, they, uh, maybe they did not have my name that time. 
so they never visit me only my father and my mother they came to visit me in idc and we were like eight eight members in idc and i have to wait for so long to see them to talk to them and even i cannot hug them cannot touch them but only i can see them like from so far behind the bars and that was like very uh, difficult moment for me to like whenever i explain so it's really hard that you can only see your parents from a distance but you cannot touch them you cannot hug them yeah and the other thing yes yeah pl oh, please go on the other thing is like the idc is like for me like whenever we get sick or someone gets sick and i do not have visa or maybe other person that do not have visa so they have to like pay 2000 baht and if there is no one coming to me there is no visa then how i can pay 2000 baht and how i can go to the hospital and if i do not have it means that i have to die inside the idc so that thing really broke my heart that there is no one for me who will come and who will pay for me and take me to the hospital yeah thank you very much for sharing to us uh, and the audience about your experience in detention center i'm sure it was a very difficult time uh now that we have you with us today uh miss speaker could you could you please share if there is one thing that you could change about the immigration detention center what would it be and why i think the refugee should not be arrested because we escaped from pakistan for better life for better future not for imprisonment because we are not criminal and we had to stay like 5 like years or 6 years in idc for our bails that thing i really that thing i feel that the refugees that who are already living a very hard life they left their home countries they are now in another country they were they had a fear that maybe we will be imprisoned in pakistan so instead of that we are facing it here so i think that thing should be changed and there should be a limit for the refugees if the police catch them then there should be a limit that maybe 5 month or 6 month for the imprisonment not 5 year or 6 or 7 years because we are, i already mentioned that we are not criminals we are here to save our lives yes i agree yeah well thank you so much for joining the call today i be really resonate in thailand in immigration detention so yeah thank you miss speaker for joining with us today and sharing your experiences with us Um now that we have an idea of why refugees are detained and what it's like to be in detention let's uh try to analyze deeper into the reasoning behind that. So um Kun Yuhani as someone who has extensively practiced and experienced human rights and immigration detention in Thailand what do you think is actually the main issue here and why do some people face indefinite detention in Thailand? Yes thank you so much um I think as you guys know and then hear from the speakers the experience in the immigration in Thailand is is very bad. What is the main cause of those experience? For me as a lawyer, I think the main cause is about the law. In Thailand, we don't have any law to protect a refugee right. It mean that even though you already get the recognized refugee status from UNHCR, but that is doesn't recognize you to get a legal status in Thailand so the law that involve is immigration acts it mean that under the eyes of thai law of the immigration acts refugee is illegal in thailand the issue is and, and another issue is very important is in the immigration acts there are no place 
to limit on how long the refugee will be detained in the immigration detention, which is mean the refugee can be detained there, uh, there for five years and then sometimes up to the 10 years. Imagine what is the crime that you commit and then you will get the punishment to be detained for 10 years. Of course, it should not be an issue about the immigration, right? Um, I think one thing that, and this is the starting point why we are, would like to talk about the rights of the refugees, especially why Thailand should not detain refugees in Thailand. And or for those people who detain to be released, but that is you have to submit the release on bail application, which is mean you need the money, is 20,000 baht, which is, oh sorry, it's 50,000 baht, which is high. And then you need a characters who are, you know, be a, a trust person that the government, that the police will trust and then uh, allow the refugees to be released on bail. Release on bail is not easy. It need to go through the criteria under the regulation of the Immigration Bureau that they decide some uh, regulation. One of that is you have to be like very sick or you, you have to like already recognize as a refugees under the UNHCR process. Again, it means not everyone able to be released on bail. If you don't have money, characters, or don't meet with any criteria that the Immigration Bureau will release people. And um, people, it, it's not only adults who be detained in the detention, it also include the children. And even the Immigration Bureau say that we have a space for the children. We don't want to detain the children in the, in the same cell with the adult, but those space is still detentions. And I would like to highlight this thing after this. Um, in, in 2019, there are some law issues. It's called the regulation of the office of the prime minister on the screening of alien who, enti who enter into the kingdom and unable to return to the country of origins. Or the NGO call this as a, a screening mechanism, national screening mechanism, which is a hope, but the law right now not even able to implement and then open for the register for the, the refugees. Since they issued in 2019, right now it's 2023, the law is still not using yet, which is make uh, a lot of uh, concern from the NGO. In this law, yes, of course, you have a right, you have a, uh, you have a chance to uh, go through the government system government will determine whether you are a person who flee from the persecution in the country of origin and not able to return or not. After that, if you satisfy them, they will issue some sort of the status called the protected person status, which is uh, followed with the, some kind of the right in, in Thailand. For example, like temporary stay, right of the education or uh, right for the healthcare. However, this is not this is not easy. Surrender yourself, then you have to go to the court hearing process, go through the process, and then maybe end up in the detention. And if you are not able to find the money for those bail uh, conditions, you are will be end up in the detention while waiting for this process. This concerns a lot of refugees in Thailand. But for me, the most concern is about the confidentialities, especially for those refugees who have a political claim. Because of in the law, there are many places that mention about the national securities, and then the form of the committee of this law is includes a lot of the government of uh, the government's department from the national security side. So this is something that very concerned. And, and then last that law is about the, uh, the entire, the, 
the preventions and suppress um, uh, of the tortures. So in that law, they mentioned in one article is uh, Article uh, 13 saying that uh, the officers, the Thai government, not able to deport people if they say that if they've been deported, they will be persecuted or be tortured, which is confirmed the principle of non reformal This is a hope as well for, pe for us who are working on the refugee side. Uh, we hope, because in the past, it's a lot of refugees being deported to the country of origin, for example, China, or for example, Cambodia, which is quite risk for them. So this is, this is a hope as well. However, this law is not implement, uh, like not, did not use for the, the prevent for the deportation yet. We have to wait and see of the practice of this law. Yeah, maybe I can stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Kun Yuhani. So now may I please bring the discussion to Kun Ganawi. Uh, from your experience in migration, various contexts of migration, are there perhaps any particularly like patterns of migration that could be observed, specifically for, for this case of Thailand? And if not by granting legal status, what has the Thai government been doing so far in response to the influx of uh, migrants and refugees? So this is uh, the panel for discussion, right? So first and foremost, colleagues, friends, brother and sister. So, uh, so in response to the, the reason for refugees, why they fled to, into Thailand, I mean, not, not only in Thailand, but all over the world for other countries, I still believe that they fled because of the persecution. So for sure, so to, to make it easy to understand, persecution, what does it mean, persecution? They fled from death. So they run away from their own country. So why they have to run away from their own country? Because as Kun Prim mentioned earlier, about the reason why they fled. So that was the, the that, that were the reason, that are the reason why they, they fled to from, from their own country. They they fled for safety. They fled from their life. They want to survive like us. Human being is a human being. So this is what I would like to, to emphasize that why they have to to flee from their own country and to be here. But in Thailand, why when they come here, why they cannot be recognized as refugees? As Kun Yohani just mentioned earlier, that uh, the reason for them not to be recognized as refugees because of the legal framework here in Thailand is not yet set for the refugees to be here. If you think about it, you will see that in Thailand now, how many refugees here in Thailand? How many recognized refugees here in Thailand? by the Thai law. I can say zero. There's no such law in Thailand that recognize individuals who flee from their own country or who flee from persecution to be here and recognize as refugee. No, not such thing in, the Thai, in, 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 in this country. So that was the reason why they have to flee from their own country. And, and uh, if there's no legal framework to recognize them as the refugees, that become a big trouble in this country. It's been long. But in Thailand, so to tell you the truth, to, to be fair with the Thai government, so in the past, so you have to see that Indochina refugee, the boat people, so the Thai government, I, I believe that was one of the best country who, who, who can take care, who can look upon the refugee situation during that time. So that, that were the f groups of people who fled from persecution and the Thai government at that time taking care of, I can say that very well, but that was the last time ever in, in this country that, that, that the royal Thai government taking care of the refugees in, in this, who have lived in the night temporary shelters, so they never been recognized as refugees. Urban refugees, they're not recognized as refugees in Thailand. So Uyghur who been detained here for nine years, consecutively never been recognized as refugee. Rohingya who been fled from their own uh, from the country of origin, never been recognized as refugee, even the citizen of the country of origin. So think about it and now at the moment. So we, we don't see any uh, any at, at the light at the end of the tunnel at the moment as we speak. And I believe that for the new government, I hope that there will be some 
light at the end of the tunnel that we will, that we will put the integral part of the policy in dealing with refugees by using the humanitarian and human right policy to integrate these two policy into the Thai national policy, especially the foreign policy to deal with refugee perfectly. I, I, I have a trust. I have a trust on a new government. So. Oh, that's a big relief to hear. <laughs> That's something uh, hopeful to, to hear today. Uh, thank you, Kun, Kun Ganavi, for sharing. Now, I understand that you've also had a chance to work with a particularly vulnerable group of people in, in Thailand, uh, specifically the Uyghur people. So could you please share more about your experience working with the Uyghur people in Thailand? Okay, sure. Now I can start my own session. So first and foremost, I'm not a good storyteller, to tell you the truth. And now I have a task to share with you my experience working for the Uyghur. So please bear with me, I'm not a good storyteller, please. But I would like to bring everyone back. My, I, I used to work with, for UNSCR, and in 2014, that was the time when I have been when I was deployed to the southern Thailand, dealing with the Rohingya situation in 2013, the end of 2013 and early 2014. There was a group of m more than 200 people. They were arrested. They were found. First, first of all, they were found by the Thai immigration. And later on, they were arrested and transferred to the Immigration D Division 6 in, in uh, Hat Yai, in Songkhla province. And at that time, no one can identify where they're from. So there were a time that UNSCR office need to go there and we have to support the Thai government, especially the immigration, to identify that who they were. So by all means, I utilize by all sources that I have to try to identify what, who are the group of these people, 200 plus people who were in the southern Thailand. It, I spent like most of the time, maybe almost one week, to try to pull all the things that I have from other countries, other operations, especially the language barrier that uh, hinder me to identify them where they're from. And until we can, we, we found out that they're from country that speak Turk, that, can, that we can understand. So at that time, I decided to inform my office here in Bangkok to communicate with Turkey embassy in Bangkok. So that was the time that the Turkish em ambassador deployed uh, the team to the southern Thailand. And we had a chance at that time. So believe it or not, one week that I have tried, that I did try to communicate with them, they never ever spo spoken to me at all. Zero sentence, zero words that come from them to me until I have a chance to bring the Turkish embassy people to come in the southern Thailand. At that time, when the people from Turkish em embassy from Bangkok arrived there and met with the group of 200 something 50 people, they cry. When they cry, I found out that yes, this might be the case that we can identify some solution for 250 people. So spent some time and initially the Thai government very supportive. The Thai government also provide me some opportunities to identify durable solutions for the 250 people, approximately 250 people at that time. We try to ask the Thai government to allow the 250 Uyghur, we found out that they come from China and later on they will allow us to resettle 250 people right away to go to Turkey. However, when I talked to the ambassador, he said that, okay, if you would like to identify durable solution for these 250 Uyghur people to be resettled in Turkey, the immigration told me that, hey, we have 150 something people in Bangkok. Can you come up with another plan? So initially, that, uh, at that time, the, the Prime Minister of Turkey, at that time, Prime Minister, now it's President, he said that, okay, I will charter one flight 
to come and pick up 250 people from southern Thailand to be resettled in Turkey right away without refugee status determination, without recognizing them as refugee. Because for, for UNICEF and also for the resettlement process, we need to identify them as refugee. They need to be recognized as refugee first before they can be resettled. And the Turkish government, they exempted the 250 people of 400 people to be resettled first. We were really happy. Thai government, UNICEF, Turkish embassy, everyone happy that we can identify durable solution for these 400 people in Thailand. Tomorrow, the Prime Minister of Turkey, he said that within 24 hours, he will send two planes to come to Thailand and to pick them up right away. I'm proud, my heart like a boom beam, like a boom boom, okay, okay, just only small guy and can help 400 people, just only not maybe only 10 calls and then we can charter two flights to come to Thailand, pick up 400 people. They can have new life. Next day, there were the interventions from the embassy of the country of origin towards the Thai government at that time. So, right away, the flight to charter flights were stopped and we cannot resettle 400 people at that time. And so my, my heart's still popping. Like, why? Human is human, no? Human beings are humans. It's like they are like us. Why we cannot identify durable solution for them? If they were resettled at that time, maybe they will not end up, 40 people will not end up in the immigration detention center. And that time was 2014. I, after 2014, I got reassignment to other countries. So these nine years, 10 years passed that day, 2014 until now as we speak, f more than 40 people still detained at immigration detention center. I found out that 109 people were returned to China. I do not know their destination. I do not, I do not know their future. And we can assume what ha ha had happened to them, 109 people. 100 plus people were resettled in Turkey. At least they can have durable solution for their own family. However, at the same time, their family were separated. Think about it as if it were us. We be separated from our families. How are we going to feel? That is the story in 2014 until now. And as we speak, almost 50 people still detained at the immigration detention center. I do not blame the Thai immigration because they have their task, they have their duty for their, they have mandate. So they cannot improve the immigration detention center because their task is to detain, to arrest, put them on trial, and after detained for a couple of days or weeks, they return the people. They, do not they have not yet been functioned to detain people over nine years. Now, think about it. How many people died in immigration detention center since 2014? People will still dying if the Thai government never changed their policy, if the Thai government never changed the position of foreign affairs of Thailand, if it's still following up with big power. If we're still afraid of shifting from one paradigm, like following up with a powerful country, those people will still in detention center. Not only Uyghur, but 91,000 of refugees along the border from Myanmar, and more than 3,000 that just crossed the border into Thailand, and Rohingya who've been detained for how many years in Thailand, they will face the same issue. They will die in Thailand without their future. For us here, we are privileged. We are quite privileged. For me, I work for UNHCR for refugees 12 years. I have lived my life in the field. I stay with refugees. I have tried to find a durable solution for refugees. I never seen which country that can detain people for 43 years in temporary shelter. I haven't seen any country that can detain Uyghur 
or any refugees in detention center for nine years without knowing that when then they can be released, when they can live normal life like us. That is the situation of refugee in Thailand. For me, if I can propose to the Thai government with the new Thai government, I will propose the issue of making the refugee law officially. Now we're just putting everything under the carpet. We never try to put all the problem over the carpet and try to clean up all the situation, all the problem over the carpet. We just put everything under the carpet all the time. I will request the new Thai government to be brave, to think about what can they do to help people. Human is human. Human are equal. I still believe that so. Sorry, I'm not a good storyteller, but it's my life experience, and more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kukai Kun Kanavi. That was very powerful, and it's particularly interesting to to observe that you know, despite all the efforts and resources available, it's been a decade, and they're still stuck in limbo at the same place. And not only them, but a lot more people. Now, uh, when we discuss the groups of vulnerable, pop vulnerable population, like the Uyghur that Kun Kanawi has mentioned, another group that I think would be worthy of discussion uh, when we're talking about Southeast Asia's migration would probably be the Rohingya people. So uh, Kun Shawarat, could you please share about your experience and the current situation of the Rohingya people who are currently in Thailand, some in detention, some not? Hello. Thank you, Kun Plim Kap. Um, uh, for me, I just responsible to talk about the Rohingya population and Rohingya in detention. Yeah. Um, I guess you all know about Rohingya um, uh, uh, background, but maybe a, a little bit of background so that uh, for those who are uh, joining from the live stream and, and 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 those who do not know in details, uh, the Rohingya are ethnic minority groups in Myanmar. Um, they are prominently a uh, Muslim uh, community and um, they are, are facing a lot of persecution and discrimination in Myanmar. Um, the UN described them as one of the group that being um, per sorry, that being persecute uh, 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 in the world. So the Rohingya crisis in 2000, 2017 uh, has resolved the number of Rohingya people displaced internally in Myanmar and internationally. Um, anyone know how many Rohingya in Bangladesh right now? Right now, Bangladesh alone hosting one million Rohingya in the country. Refugee um, a protection system in the country as well is really difficult for them. Uh, but also Thailand and Indonesia also hosting some significant number of Rohingya as well. Now, uh, in 2022, um, there are a number of Rohingya uh, from Bangladesh as well as Myanmar traveling by sea and by land. Um, around 3,700 of them uh, are report, you know, travel during that time, and we never know how many we lost in the sea or by land, you know? Um, until the UN last year, they also mentioned that um, uh, uh, there is the critical moment that uh, uh, there could be a risk of Rohingya die at sea last year. Uh, and also, I'm not talking about by land. How many could die by land as well? And we don't know. But for Thailand, when we come back to Thailand, there are a significant number of Rohingya in Thailand as well, just 
just to understand that Rohingya, uh, uh, they came to Thailand actually since at the at, at the 90, 1990s at that time. Uh, since then, they already have some community, Rohingya community in Thailand. But at the same time, uh, uh, there are a lot of newcomers. Uh, we are approximately in 2017, there are about 6,000 to 7,000 Rohingya people in Thailand. But in recent year, when I told you that last year, because of the dry condition in the Bangladesh and Myanmar, there are a lot of people moved to Thailand, to, to, to a neighboring country, including Thailand. Um, at this year, uh, last year alone, um, we approximately that there are 700 of Rohingya being arrested and detained or in the hand of the government of Thailand uh, right now. That including more than 100 of children in detention and some of them, can, very small one, can access to the government shelter or um, uh, 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 the human trafficking shelter or the, 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 the ch children shelters. So that's, that's giving us alarm that there are, there are a lot of people right now that being detained and there is no, no, no durable solution for them because uh, the Fort Rohingya, they, they are not eligible or the Thai government do not allow them to register or to access to the refugee status determination under the UNSCR mandate. As a result, they are unable to, you know, um, find such durable solution. There are some, but it's very limited, and 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 that's that's become a big issue in Thailand right now, where uh, we have hundreds of them in detention, and and we can expect that there will be more this year and next year because the condition in Bangladesh is really dry and there are a lot of human rights violations in Bangladesh, in Myanmar and we can expect that there will be number of Rohingya travel to Thailand, to Malaysia, to Indonesia and other countries. Now, um, the Thai government, civil society and UN agencies, we are trying to help them so we have to, 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 to take this in, in, on, on the table as well, that um, we are trying to help them, but right now the policy or law that responding to Rohingya is very limited. Right now, Thai government using Human Trafficking Act, um, the alternative to detention for children policy, and uh, um, uh, the new national referral mechanism under net the Trafficking Act to respond to Rohingya displacement in Thailand. The fact that we have in the past, if you remember when we have Rohingya crisis in 2015, there are a number of Rohingya came to Thailand and there are a lot of you know, um, bad situation in Thailand until the Thai government use the Anti-Trafficking Act and most of them, I would say 100% of them, act can in be included under the anti-trafficking system where they can be protected. But nowadays, nowadays when we have more and more Rohingya people come in the new, new groups, they've been screened out from the traffic anti-trafficking system. Why? Is that because of the quality of the screening? Is that because of the political agenda behind that? There are so many, you know, issues around that that we need to find out. But I can say that the new group of Rohingya, none of them access to anti-trafficking act system now. Why? Now, um, there are some key challenges that I, 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 I would like to share. Um, so so the, the, the screen out from, 
from the Trafficking Act is one thing that I want to mention. Uh, but when for me, when, I, when people say that it's the problem of the screening system, it's the problem around political agenda, but for me, I think that if you put the first bottom wrong, you know, everything will be wrong. So the Rohingya, of course, they are in the context of trafficking, but not only that, they are also escaping to Thailand because of the persecution because of the violence in their home country or in, in Bangladesh as well. So there should be a refugee seasonality act can handle this population as well, not only trafficking act, anti-trafficking act that responding right now. Um, the other issue is that um, uh, we we have learned from peop from Rohingya people who came to Thailand that they they want to reunite with their family in Malaysia. Some people has been told that they could find a job in Malaysia. Some people told them that they could have a better education if they go to Malaysia. Um, uh, and also, there are some cases that have been, you know, arranged marriage for them, and they need to be forced to Malaysia by their parents because their parents rent, like, borrow money from their neighbor, and they need to, to, to pay back, and there's no escape. So, these factors also push number of Rohingya to come to Thailand. And if Thailand, like Kunnon said, if you are trying to put them under the carpet, there is no solution for that. The situation will be worse and worse. I want to recall again on the, the, this, this incident in 2015 when we found a graveyard of Rohingya in the southern of Thailand. There are hundreds of graveyards uh, of grave, of Rohingya grave, and the detention camps run by traffickers in Thailand in 2015. There are a number of, of uh, state officials being arrested uh, and, and persecuted by that. But if you look back to eight years ago until now, nothing changed. What I want to warn the new Thai government was that we might face that situation again, where we might find a body of Rohingyas in the jungle again, or we might find the body of Rohingya in a truck again, if Thailand do not shift their policy to support the Rohingya population. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Mushawarat. That was a very powerful uh, storytelling. Thank you for sharing about an extremely vulnerable group of population, the Rohingya. Now, I understand from your, from your uh, speech that uh, one of the legal mechanisms that has been used to deal with vulnerable population, including the Rohingya people, is alternative to detention. So um, now that we can jump back to the legal ground, uh, Kun Yuhani, I understand that you have had experience working with particularly vulnerable population as well, but this time being children, particularly children in detention. So uh, from your observation and from your experience, uh, how, how, has it, it, how has it been working out, like the, the alternatives to detention for children? Is it really implemented and are there any interesting observations you'd like to make? Yeah. So first of all, before talking about the implementation of the policy, for me, I would like to say that to detain the children who fled f with the families is unacceptable because the children, they don't have a free of the decision to make a decision whether they want to go to anywhere because they are children. They flee to the country with their family. So to detain those children is unfair for them. And for the unaccompanied minors as well, they are more vulnerable. As Kun Chawarat mentioned about many 
people who are detained in the detention. A big group of them is unaccompanied minors, who is the Rohingyas, which is unfair at all to detain the children and minor just because of the immigration issues. So yes, as Kun Prim mentions that in Thailand, we have a policy, it's not a law yet, it's just a policy. The Thai government try to issue some kind of policy to say that, okay, right now we will not detain a children who are you know, immig my immigrant children in the, deten in the immigration detention anymore. This policy, at the beginning is a hope as well. I, I mentioned about hope many times. It means that Thailand always issues something that the NGO, when, when we heard, we said like, oh, this is hope. This is something might me move and then improve the human rights situation in Thailand. However, it's end up that the policy is just separate the children from the adult detention but put in another place where they call the daycares. So when you mentioned about, when, when you heard about daycare, it's just a, you know, it's a place for student and mother to be just like one and two hour there, right? But this is not. It's, 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 it's a place that very similar with the detention. What they do is they put the student and the mother in the daycare, and then the next step is back to the immigration act that I mentioned. The mother need to submit the application to release on bills. Again, it's request money, it's request a guarantor. No, not everyone have those kind of things. Or if they have, they might need to wait for many, many months. For example, they connect to the donor outside saying that, can you please help me? I have three children with me in the daycare in this center. And to release the children, you need, uh, I need to be released on bail, which is mean I need money. Can you help? So this is something that uh, push to the private people or to like an NGO to try to find uh, a solution for the children. And even in the policy, they mentioned that for the best interest of the child, the child should not be detained in the detention for long, for long times, right? Which is mean should be not more than a week, right? For the best interest, a week is too long, actually. But in our experience, sometimes it takes almost two months with those people who already have a money for bail and other guarantors. And imagine for those people who don't have those kind of resources yet, how long they have to wait. Again, I think, and, and I think what I see are the law to make the international countries or people to see that, okay, Thailand have some source of the law to protect people. The most important is about how you implement that law and how that law protect people, right? If you said you don't want to detain children, in practical, the children should not be in the detention at all. And this is something that I would like to call for the new government for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun Yuhani. So we might agree here that a long-term solution for refugees issue might still be relevant to legal mechanisms, but not only for the creation of policies, but also the implementation to making sure that those laws are enforced the way they were created in the first place. So uh, now, now that we have discussed things like policy and long-term solution here, uh, it, it's possible that what we could raise for in, in the future is that Thailand should fulfill its human rights obligations under international law, and especially the right to seek asylum. So at this point of discussion, may I please bring in Pia from the OHCHR to talk about the international community's stance on immigration detention. And based on these, these benchmarks, these uh, universal standards, uh, 
how do you think Thailand's doing so far, and what do you think Thailand could potentially do to improve such a uh, benchmark and stance? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prim, and thank you also to the fellow panelists, because um, uh, I've learned a lot already today about the experience of, of Thailand, and I think today on World Refugee Day, um, we really have an opportunity to stop, I think, and, and hear the stories and consider the, the reality in which refugees, uh, people on the move, live their everyday lives. I mean, we see it as well in the artwork um, outside to hear about um, the, the testimony we heard from the refugee with lived experience of the ways in which immigration detention, and particularly, I'd like to focus in on that, particularly immigration detention when it's mandatory or indefinite um, and therefore arbitrary. And I think that that is the characteristic for much of the detention we see. We see the impact on uh, mental and physical health. We see the impact on the ability of people to access justice, on the, their right to a dignified existence, among others. So we see the, the very lived reality um, of this kind of detention. Under international uh, human rights law, arbitrary detention is a violation. And, and its prohibition is absolute. So it's, it's, it's very, very clear that there are no exceptions to this in international law. It can never be justified. Arbitrary detention can never be justified, including in the context of things like national emergency or public security or in seeking to deal with the movement of certain national or ethnic groups that may be um, uh, problematic or, or difficult for the state to handle. Arbitrary detention is never um, allowed. But I'd like to go a little bit further and say that even when it is not arbitrary, uh, when some detention may be uh, a, a allowed by law, I think it's important for us to realize that immigration detention has profound and very far-reaching negative impacts on the lives of individuals, which leaves them disproportionately vulnerable. And I think we've heard already from the panelists about you know, that, that kind of creep, nine years in detention, what is that going to do to the person? So the U United Nations Human Rights Office that I represent is of the view that any discussion of, my, of immigration detention should actually not begin with detention, but with its effective opposite, which is the fundamental human right to liberty. Article 9 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which, of course, Thailand is a state party, guides us that everyone, regardless, everyone has the right to liberty and security of public, how they've moved, where they've moved, everyone has the right to liberty. And international human rights best practice is clear that migration or mobility, even when it is unauthorized, should not be penalties, should apply to migrants, including refugees, who cross borders or stay in a country without the correct documents or who move otherwise irregularly. And this guidance is not, and I'd like to make that clear, it's not intended to and should not be seen as interfering with the sovereign prerogative of states to control their borders. Rather, the guidance seeks to advise on how such control may be best carried out in ways that protect the rights of all and in full recognition that those who cross borders irregularly uh, to escape violence, conflict, or persecution, as we've heard about the various groups seeking refuge um, in Thailand, or to seek work or to reunite with family or to flee environmental threat, people that cross borders irregularly are not criminals. And we heard that very clearly from uh, our guest speaker earlier uh, in the event. So our call, therefore, is to reconsider and I think that that's maybe the space that we've opened up here, reconsider the migration management policies of criminalization on which these immigration detention regimes are based. And I'd like to note in this context that there's a stigmatizing effect of criminalizing irregular migration and that we give the message that refugees, that migrants are criminals, that they are violent and they are dangerous to society. And we know that this is often, most often, simply not true. We do not see criminality, and we should not be associating vulnerable people with that criminality. Now, the UN Human Rights System has recently developed a range of detailed guidance concerning immigration detention. So in September 2021, the Committee on the Rights of Migrant Workers adopted General Comment Number 5 on migrants' rights to liberty, freedom from arbitrary detention, and their connection with other human rights which clarifies the scope of the prohibition of arbitrary detention in the context of migration and provides direction on the development, implementation, and monitoring 
of rights-based alternatives to detention, some of the practices that, that we've already heard about. Other UN human rights mechanisms have also issued relevant uh, guiding documents, including the joint general comment by the CMW and the Committee on the Rights of the Child, looking at the situation um, uh, particularly of children, um, on state obligations regarding the human rights of children in the context of international migration. Again, with the clear guidance that such detention is never in a child's best interest and must always be avoided. Here in the sub-regional level, we have the ASEAN Declaration on the Rights of Children in the Context of Migration. And again, ASEAN states have agreed to develop alternatives to immigration detention in order to promote the best interests of the child. And they've reaffirmed their commitment to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I'd like to look within the frameworks that we're looking at, also maybe at some kind of more uh, soft law frameworks, because um, as some of you might know, Thailand is a champion country of the Global Compact uh, for Migration, and its Objective 13 states agreed that immigration detention should only be used as a last resort, rather really than the first resort that we see in a lot of the context of Thailand, and that immigration detention should not be promoted as a deterrent for the International Migration Review Forum um, in May last year. There was frank recognition of the practical challenges that are faced in ensuring alternatives to detention, which must be carried out in full respect of human rights. But member states also committed to working to end the practice, again, of child detention. And we must realize that this is a really important start, but also realizing that we must go further. Um, I think it's really important that we understand the specific vulnerability of children. We've already heard about that, to, to understand uh, that children should never be in detention. But we also know the devastating effects of immigration detention on vulnerable individuals, including adults. And I think all of the Uyghurs that are in detention are, are adults. So I think we need to go further. In Thailand, the United Nations Network on Migration has formed a sub-working group under the co-leadership of the International Detention Coalition as well as the UN Human Rights Office with really the objective to support the government to enhance the implementation of alternatives to detention for migrant children and their families and to encourage and, and um, uh, imagine alternatives to detention and rice-based sustainable solutions. So on World Refugee Day this year, it really is our very fervent wish from the, the side of the UN Human Rights Office that we can move towards gradually seeing space opening up, move towards a reality in Thailand where every refugee, every vulnerable migrant is able to enjoy their fundamental right to liberty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia. So uh, now that we've heard about the first-hand experience of people in detention, uh, the legal background under Thai law, and experiences with working with uh, vulnerable groups of people, including the Uyghur, the Rohingya, and children, as well as international legal principles on immigration detention, uh, I would like to take this chance to open up the floor for a 15-minute Q&A discussion. So if any of the audience has questions or things they would like to discuss, uh, please take this moment, uh, please. Yes. Yeah, uh, audience, if you have a question, please go to the back. There is a mic stand if set up if you're interested in going. Thank you. As far as I know, I want have to one, uh, one two questions. So if we bring up the refugee institution to the table, it will, I will see that. It will not be a Taiwan issue. It can, it can be the global issue, something like that. So, as I can see, we have many countries that have a specific rider. They have everybody from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and China. So, all of this issue, Thai government cannot work alone. How can we increase the cooperation between countries to? improve the situation of refugee in a Thailand. If anyone has an answer, feel free to answer my question. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, certainly, certainly, sir. That Thai, Thailand alone cannot work on the refugees issue because refugees, as we can, as we all know, that refugees are the situation whereby so more than one country involved on the the situation, and as a result, that you that there are the regional context, there are regional framework that have been utilized uh, to deal with the situation of refugees of the irregular migration for sure, but. First and foremost, if we talk about in Thailand, Thailand need to be ready to 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 tackle with the situation of the irregular migration. If Thailand is not ready, so I believe that the regional context will not applicable, will not be applicable. So if Thailand, the new government, they can they can try to formulate some kind of policy, not only the policy but the law. That the legal framework that can support, that can be supportive in terms of dealing with refugee situation, we can deal with other countries, not only for the country of origin of the refugees, but also the regional context. Because, like for example, for the Rohingya situation, not only from Myanmar and Thailand that been impacted by the situation. However, there are so many countries like Malaysia, Indonesia. We can we can build or we can establish the regional block that can deal with the situation uh, more effectively and more. Efficiently, so for sure, yeah. That is for for my 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 quick response to you. Peter, um, maybe just to add on, um, um, I have a lot of chance to talk to uh, diplomat missions in Thailand as well as the government officials in Thailand. What what I have learned from both sides was that when at at one point when there is the discussion between states, um, they will always ask if anything they can be collaborated, right? You know what is the first answer, or always answer from the Thai government? Anyone can tell? Can you resettlement people here? <laughs> so. What need to understand is that the Thai government now still do not still perceive themselves as the transit country, but in the reality, we need to understand the migra mixed migration flow. That there are people want to travel outside Thailand. We are there are people want to stay in Thailand. There are people want to just stay for temporarily in Thailand, and many more. But not just responding by, do you have resettlement quota? So the Thai government need to change its position first. That they need to accept the reality that right now it's not just transit country, but you need a different approach to respond to the mixed migration, and that how the international community. I believe there are so many diplomat community here in Thailand, especially the South State, would be willing to support Thailand. Thank you. Thank you. Get hope. My, the answer for my question will benefit all of us here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next question, please. Hi. Um, my name is G. Uh, I work with the refugees uh, as an uh, art therapist and um, usually the adults that are at home uh, but they are always either married or children of or uh, somehow re related to somebody in IDC. So I have been uh, able to visit weekly for, for several years but now I can't go in. Um, IDC has been closed because of COVID and my concern is they cannot have any visitors and my heart is breaking. Is there any way, anything that can be done to reopen IDC for the visitors so that the visitors can go in and bring, um, you know, greetings and goodies from home? Thank you, I think like, thank you so much to bring this issue up. 
I think this is something that happened for three years and then continues. We do get a lot of complaint from the family outside saying that they are not able to even contact or visit. And then sometimes even they cannot go to visit the family in the immigration detention by themselves, but they can at least give a home cooked food to the visitor like you and bring for to them. This is, this is something is like kind of small happiness that they have, right? And yes, right now the, the, the detention is like not allowed for the visit. And then for NGO our side, we are try to ask the, the immigration bureau, the, 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 the department who take care of the, the immigration detention for many times. But the answer we get is, is it still COVID? who will take care of uh, if they are, you know, the COVID that spread in the detention and still use this, um, this as a reason why they are not allowed for the, for the visit. I cannot answer how we can make them to, you know, allow to visit again, but I can say that this is something that we are keep talking, asking, and then not only us, but you guys as well. You should ask them, you should show them that, hey, this is at least is a right for the detainee to be visit. And just add on a little bit. For the people who are detained in the detentions, they will be in the cell for 24 hours. And then they allow to be uh, go to exercise only like three days after that, like three days, every three days. Which is mean for people to visit them is a chance for them to just get out from the cell, be stuck there and then not able to go even like downstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add on a little bit, so I believe that the big question mark is about the how we have to separate about the individuals who enter into Thailand illegally and refugees. So refugees are not people who enter into Thailand illegally. They enter into Thailand or enter into other country with the reason of the fleeing from persecution. So in Thailand, if we if the Thai government agree and also they can foresee the problem of the refugee situation, they will not put a refugee in the immigration <coughs> detention center. And the immigration bureau will not be the one who responsible for refugee situation. So that's the, if it can make like that, the, pro, the, the question that you mentioned about the, how to visit the refugee inside immigration detention center will not be the question. So that's it. Uh, we we are, for me. I'm 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 tackling about the structure of the refugee response mechanism in Thailand. So if we can formulate some kind of policy or the issue, the some kind of the legal framework in dealing with refugees, that will that will be the long term. In in fact, it's not a long term. It's it's a, I think it's a middle term. <laughs> so we we are trying to to do some kind of the formulation of the policy and also the. Uh, issuing the, the, the legal framework that dealing with refugees. So just only to add on on the structure. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I say in question, anyone can answer. So the first question, just in case that uh, anybody missed the beginning part, uh, as a new MP, Kun Ganawi, you're forming a new government. What would be the first thing you would do practically? either amending the law or changing, uh, drafting uh, new legislation to help refugees uh, uh, to bring the better life for them, either urban refugees or the refugee along the border. The first practical thing you would do in office. Um, second part of the question is that, as we know, uh, UNSCR durable solution, there are three durable solutions. One is voluntary repatriation, which is not really possible right now with conflicts going on. Uh, the second one is to resettlement which is a very, very small number, or maybe the number is getting larger as the conflicts go on. Then the third solution, which never been explored in this country, is the local integration. So I'm wondering, in your view, any of you and panelists, uh, what's the possibilities of, of bringing in the conversation of the local integration of refugees? This refugee, before they come as refugees, they're, they're doctors, 
the teachers, the architect, the engineer, they have so much capacity to help uh, bring the country. And if we um, localize them, integrate them into society, they will be so thankful for the host country. So that's two part of my, my question just to, to discuss here. Thank you. The first question is directly to me, right? Sure. So for me, I am quite optimistic. So this is the, uh, the, the issue of refugees is my, uh, one of my, not my dream, but my priority that I would like to, to go fairly in Thailand and believing in having legal framework in dealing with the refugees. So this is what I have tried to discuss with my, my colleagues, especially the, the, the new elected MPs, that we would like to come up with the, not amending the law, but creating the new law in dealing with the refugees. The, the thing that I just mentioned earlier, that we have to bring all the dirt under the carpet over the carpet and clean up all the issue here that against and violating the human rights situation, the humanitarian response. So I'm trying to do my best. So this is the roadmap that we, we're trying to, to come up with the new law to, to, to have some kind of the act if we can. And uh, uh, if not yet, the, the, uh, the refugee decree, the decree that we can draft and we can submit to the parliament when we open the parliament. So this is the first thing that I would like to do from myself. The second one for local integration. So Kun Mik would like to, yeah, please come. Um, for the second one, um, maybe I recall what I mentioned about Thailand is not the transit country. So that's what we believe as well. Um, but just to say that for CISP, for the, for, for the Coalition for the Right of Refugees Standard Person, which is the Thai network who are advocating for refugee right, you know, for many years now. What we believe is that refugee could be a part of society, could be a part of social, uh, economic, and political development in Thailand. And therefore, press release here that, that we, we have shared you, uh, there are um, uh, uh, recommendation one and two. Uh, we have no, we have learned that in Thailand we are going to they are going to implement the national screening mechanism for refugee. Can't wait because we wait for four years already. But uh, we have some confirmation that they are going to start the first case, which is great. But we have learned that there are even though it's not in the law, but there are some discriminatory measures that they might not include some particular groups, for example, Uyghurs for ex uh, of interior. But if we can push with the new Thai government that can use existing policy that in place to be inclusive, to include everyone, I think that's the first thing that they can do in 100 days under the new Thai government, to, include, to be able to include everyone who apply. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that if you apply, there is, will be a process of criminalization. So we need to try to address that issue that for people who apply under this screening mechanism, uh, the Thai government need to consider the Article 17 of the Immigration Act to use the cabinet approval to allow those people who apply to have a temporary stay in Thailand. The third point is that, you know, we can't deal with protect situation of refugee without, you know, right to work because they need to work and contribute to the society. We are talking about put them in the right place, have them the right to work, allow them to pay tax and contribute to the society. And that could be done in 100 days as well. So that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Just wish Kun Ganawi luck for the forming the new government. <laughs> because Thai people cannot wait and refugee cannot wait. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pascal. I just wanted to ask, what do you all think is the reason that the Thai government has historically been and is still, still is so resistant to legislation protecting refugees? 
I'm not mad. I talk too much. <laughs> yeah, you want to say anything? <laughs> Thank you. I guess I'll take that because the, but the rest of my panelists are not stepping up. Um, I think the, 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 the issue is, is really um, what you've just spoken about, the fact that um, uh, uh, refugee protection um, can be a very political issue, can be seen as a very political issue. Now, of course, from the side of the United Nations and others, we see it as a non-political, as a humanitarian human rights um, uh, area. But when you, when you understand the geopolitics of where refugees are coming from and where they're going to, of course, it can come into uh, the, the calculus of how uh, member states or nation states see each other's citizens. So I guess what, what we would like to see really is that hopeful vision that has been put forward to say that the people that are crossing borders that are fleeing persecution or conflict or violence, and I would also go a bit further, to be honest. I would say that in today's world, where we're seeing things that are happening that may not even be the focus or the fault of a government, we're seeing environmental degradation, we're seeing you know, climate change, people will cross borders because people move. Um, and that is the reality of how the world has evolved. Um, and I think that the, 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 a, a way to kind of come out of the impasse that we see where, where it becomes a political issue is to acknowledge that people have rights, that people move, and when they move, they may need particular protections that, are, that member states have also agreed to of the United Nations. So it's not that Mick is kind of forcing the Thai government to uh, you know, sign conventions governments have all voluntarily uh, taken on human rights conventions and signed them, and the obligation to respect them is theirs as well. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? How likely do you think it is that Thailand's going to step up anytime soon to sign said conventions, especially coming from a new MP? Do you think this is going to happen within <laughs> the next four years? <laughs> Uh, if, if, if it were me, you know, I, I'm a former UNICEF staff member. Believe it or not, I'm the one who tried to encourage the Thai government. So before I joined UNICEF, I was working for National Security Council. That's another issue. So National Security Council, I've been, when I was there, I was still pushing the Thai government to ratify, to sign the, the refugee convention and also protocol. However, we, we can have some reservation, right? And when I was with UNICEF, I tried to push forward the Thai government to, to consider ratification of the 1951 convention and 1967 protocol. That's my, 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 my position, my standpoint. So if, it, if I have a chance, and, but you know, to tell you the truth, I've been working with UNICEF for quite some year. I believe that if the Thai government can have its own law, it's much better. 1951 convention, 1967 protocol on the status of the refugees. So I still believe that if we have our own law, we do our refugee status determination. We do some uh, identified durable solution like what we're talking about, uh, local integration. It's out of the question. However, we need to have some expertise. We need to have some skills in order for us to formulate our own law here. But I, I will push both sides. And if I, I don't know how to answer, how, how, how soon that we can push. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sai from uh, Central Islamic Committee in Thailand and also from Council for Humanitarian Networking of Sheikh Islam. I have two concerns about today's event. The first uh, event, uh, the first concern is my observation that we don't see any officials from the IDC coming to join our session today. I don't know what is, what is the reason, because this one is straight to the topic, straight to the heart, you know. They should come and join us today. At least come and listen to the translation here. We have Thai translation here. They should come and join us and see from the perspective that what we want from them, especially uh, Non, uh, Mr. Non will be an MP soon, I hope. And uh, we will have a very good start, uh, a glimpse of hope for the refugee. Because I have to tell myself that I have been working with refugee for the past six, seven years, helping them urban in, in urban in Bangkok, like Muslim, uh, because it turns out to many refugees are Muslim. Somalia, 
Rohingya, Uyghur, and Palestine. Most of them are Muslim. I mean, 90% are Muslim. Very few are minority or other uh, religion. And the problem, following the problem is about the payment issues. Overstay fine, 20,000 baht, 50,000 baht bailout. This is the problem that we need to find a solution. I want to ask uh, Kun Mik or uh, Kun Yuhani or Kun Non about the issue that if we have a better exit or a better solution to not pay 50,000 baht for bailout during the process of the UNSCR and uh, finding uh, what country to go for the third country, or about the solution of 20,000 baht when they want to fly out of Thailand. Can we not pay this money? Because this money, many refugees cannot find the money because they cannot work, they cannot have jobs, they cannot get paid. So they have to come to the donations like us. And we as an Islamic community of Thailand, Muslims come to find help, we need to find, we need to help them. Of course, it's our Muslim brothers. So this is a very big issue and I want everyone, anyone on the panel to answer this question or Pro, I mean, pressure the government, especially the police side, to uh, have a better solution about payments. Thank you. Uh, I think I think back to the main points of release on bail. Um, if the people would like to be free from the detention, you need to pay, and it's not. It's not just for the bail money, as Kunasahi mentioned. It's always the country you need to pay for twenty thousand baht before go to the immigration detention. You have to go to the court hearing process, and the punishment uh, can be five more than three thousand baht. Everything is cost a lot of money. We 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 and then for the NGO, we know that this is something that the government push this burden to the refugees and actually it's put the burden for the NGO a lot. As Kunasa, he mentioned, uh, the Cheku Islami, I'm not sure one year how much you pay to the immigration bureau due to the helping refugees. Sometimes maybe go to the million, I'm not sure. However, we, we know about this point. We negotiate, we talk, we you know do a kind of policy advocacy. Right now, it's on the stage to negotiate to the Immigration Bureau. At the first time, we negotiate to not charge any you know, money for the bail or for the other costs. However, they come back to us and say, like, no, this is impossible. But what we try to do now is try to decrease the amount of 50,000 baht for the bail to 20,000 baht for the bail. It still costs a lot. 20,000 is a lot of things. So we now just go to this level, but hopefully new government can do more things. And then we want to see that at the end, no one should pay, should pay a bail money for just they are refugees. Could I just come in on that, actually, because I think I have another recommendation um, for, for the new government, and that is that, um, and I think that this is borne out by practice in, in many parts of the world, that if you're going to have uh, an asylum system that works, you have to have a migration governance system that works as well. Because I would say that you need to have um, detention as a last resort for everybody. Um, it's not going to be, you know, kind of good enough to say, well, we will take refugees out of that and we'll leave other vulnerable migrants in there or children will be detained if they're not refugee children, etc. Our experience has been that, you know, you have to get all moving parts of this right to not for anybody have unsustainable bail bonds, to not for anybody have long-term detention when it is in nobody's interest and is really expensive, as IDC knows. So I would really like there to be a, a recommendation to say that you have to get all the moving parts of your migration governance right, um, and then you're, you're bound to get refugee protection right as well. Just to respond to your qu first question about why we don't have immigration bureau here. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, um, we we we've been talking with immigration bureaus, national uh, security agencies as well, 
Right. Uh, but because this event is called up for the new Thai government to mm. end or stop detention, I see. So it might be difficult for them to sit on this floor <laughs> and telling, you know, like ask the government official to call out for that. Uh, but I believe because I still got some of the message from right. my immigration colleague that they are listening in the live stream too. So so what do you come? Let me just say a quick thing. So I cannot speak on behalf of the new government <laughs> just yet, believe it or not. But I will, I'll, right. I'll take note already. So uh, for the asylum system and also migration system, from my own capacity, I will do from from by all means. But for the new government. Let them form the new government and then I will, I will push <laughs> forward. Yes, I hope I, we, we all NGOs and everyone here on this floor will have a, a good trust in Mr. Gandhi for the future in going to the parliament and will be our voice of hope for the refugees in the future, I hope, inshallah. 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 Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very excited to have a very uh, active uh, audience joining us in our Q&A session. I noticed there's about three more people in line. Uh, so I think that will just be it. So we'll not, unfortunately, we won't be accepting more, more questions after the three people currently in line. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aisha Sadika, and uh, I'm a student in Mahidol University in the Faculty of Human Rights and Democratization. And I'm visiting IDC from last eight years. and. I know the uh, policies and advocacy might take time, but now the problem is from last two years when we disconnected with the visiting IDC, and before we had the uh, guarantors from some churches, they had to become a guarantor, and then we pay a 50,000 baht money for the bail. But after COVID, uh, there are some guarantors who get old and they just uh, left that work. And after COVID, now there's few grantors who are working, but they are also charging, taking a bribe from the refugee's family. And now if the refugee person who want to get bail, he have to pay uh, almost 85,000 baht, which uh, only he will get back 50,000 baht when he will left the country. So the problem is if uh, somehow the refugees can arrange the money 50,000 baht, or maybe some organizations are helping, but never any organization will be agree to pay the bribe money. So that money also have to do the, and also some organizations, they only help to women to get bail out. And that for the male side, they have to pay 85,000 baht. And on one side, when the refugees are not allowed to work, so just think how the people are getting bail out, 85,000 baht, yeah. and they're taking loan or what kind of work, like from, we're there, so I have request that please, I, I know other policies might take time, but this is a, like a very hot issue since the COVID start and then refugee families because they are afraid, so they are just paying. I don't know how they arrange that money, but please look at this issue. It's uh, very uh, painful for the refugee communities and before, like there should be a arrangement for the guarantors at least. We refugees are ready to pay maybe 50,000 baht, but at least we have the guarantor that don't uh, blackmail the refugees. Even sometime after they blackmail them when they have to come for the sign every month, twice in IDC. So they are asking for the money, otherwise we will not come and you have, your bail will be canceled. So this is like a different kind of uh, mental trauma for the refugee families. So please look at this uh, bribe issue, especially in IDC. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so due to time constraint, uh, we'll, we'll kindly ask the, the people participating in the Q&A session to ask uh, all the questions now, and then the panel will, will ask. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you for speaking. Uh, and I would like to uh, help another audience to translate his question. Uh, he was a UN refugee, and uh, he he uh, was uh, detained like for seven years, uh, I mean, for seven, to seven months in the International Detention Center, uh, detention center uh, in Bangkok. And uh, his question is, uh, do you have any plan to walk up? As you probably you know, the, uh, they don't have like clean water or in the, the rooms, the cells filled with smokes. And also 
uh, if there's some like deaths, uh, people people pass away, and without proper investigation, so there are any plan to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have a next question? Yes. Yes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Zen, and actually, I don't have any question. I came here with a request, actually. So before I make a request, I would like to make some rectification about the bail money. So there are three category about paying the bail money for the detainee. Okay. So if the person is rejected by the UNHCR, that particular person has to pay. 130,000 baht, which is a lot of money. And on the second hand, if a person is refugee and had been detained, and then p that particular person has to pay like uh, 100,000 baht. And if the person is like only a person of concern or an asylum seeker, okay, then uh, like that person has to pay, pay like almost like uh, around about like eight, uh, 85,000 or something like that. So it's just like been keep on like going up and down. So no one has that exact idea. And apart from that, there is like, you know, traveling allowance that that particular person has to pay for, for his release. And then there is this vaccination money. I don't know which comes about like more than like 150,000 maybe. Okay. So there, there is like, uh, you know, we don't know that what exactly has happened right now. But when we talk to the immigration police, you know, I, I have once an encounter who are working for you and, you know, standing behind you. If they are ready to work with them, uh, we, they are ready to work with us, then we are ready to, like, shake hand with them. And we are ready to help the re and time-taking process. Why don't we just, like, help out these refugees or these detainees to, to be considered a normal person? Maybe uh, there should be some kind of assist right now about for thinking like the 20, 20 year period or 30 year, uh, year period. Why don't we just like discuss, discuss about this thing? That, that's a request, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, thank you for other questions. Um, I think um, all three questions relate to bail, bail, bail system. Um, uh, it's it's really difficult issue, but what I'm trying to say first thing is that Thailand, the Thai government or Thai immigration, rely too much on bail. Every alternative 54 where um, the, immig uh, the immigration officer have authority to allow them to be uh, reside in Thailand for temporarily uh, in, in in the in the location that they they, they tell. Um, so. We know that they are rely a lot on bill, but on one hand, like I said, there still uh, there will be a national screening mechanism come up, where what we are trying to advocate is that, uh, so that's this national screening mechanism still focus on bill as well, but they will reduce bill for people who access to that system. Uh, it could be a dual system because I still don't, don't know if UNHCR still operate the, RS, the refugee status determination, but we can expect that anyone access to refugee status determination text. So in Thailand context, what the Thai Government Immigration Act approved by cabinet to allow people who access to that system to have a right to stay temporarily in Thailand. So that will no longer for bill. So just trying to uh, explain how it can be practical within a short time frame. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in the Q and A session. I'm glad w I, I'm glad that we have a lively audience who has a lot of issues to raise. I know the panel pat on uh, what they expect the new Thai government to do when they come into office and uh, what should the Thai government do to ensure protection of human rights, including refugee rights. Are you going to say anything? I'm happy to. I think we already mentioned. I, I can go with one uh, recommendation. I know that the, the colleagues have probably um, made many recommendations. I'm not going to look at you, I promise. <laughs> um, but just uh, thinking out loud, um, because uh, we are in the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration um, for Human Rights. Um, this is obviously 
uh, you know, an important uh, time to think about the rights of, of refugees and other vulnerable individuals. And I would like to encourage the government of Thailand to, to the new government um, uh, alternatives to immigration detention already. Um, they, they, you know, have, have put out that, that um, they would like to enhance uh, the uh, immigration detention, applying that same logic that children, it is never in the best interest of a child to be detained. And so we'd like them to maybe, you know, take, take the next step uh, to maybe issue a pledge around the 75th anniversary. Um, uh, we will be holding a number of pledging conferences at the end of the year uh, that to come maybe prepared to uh, think about who else should immigration detention not be applied to. Thank you very much, Pia. Um, for me, the recommendation could be, I mean, I've been talking a lot about recommendation of Thai society is the perception of everyone who will be here or will be in Thailand. And so uh, what we might need to do, and especially you guys who come here to, 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 the, to the event here, I think let's help each other to call out, to make, make it happen by, you know, tell your friend, talk to your colleagues, a better life in Thailand. Uh, I think Thailand in the aging society, uh, we are at short of labor in time soon. Uh, Thai government need to think differently on how we can, you know, mobilize labor force from different uh, uh, places uh, to be able to fit in um, to, 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 to the economy of Thai society. So public perception is the most important for the change. Thank you, Kun Chawarat. Um, refugee issue is the shared responsibilities. It's me told to the third country as soon as they can, but thinking about the, uh, the, the solution in Thailand as well. So it can be the right to work. It can be a right to stay integrations. Again, refugee is human. They are, many of them are the skills from Pakistan. And he just said to not able to do things that he used to do. So with this skill, they are, you know, able to contribute a lot of good things in the country. So this is something that I would like to ask for the government. Should they ask? That's a little bit funny if I ask the new government, right? <laughs> But again, I, I think that refugee situation is one of the issue uh, under the, foreign, uh, the Thai foreign policy. So I would urge, I would encourage the, Thai, the new Thai government to reconsider its position on the foreign policy of the country. Because the Thai government never changed their policy, especially in terms of the foreign policy that much. So that's why the position of Thailand is not going through this uh, issue of hu human rights and humanitarian. So if the new government coming to, 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 to the office, I would encourage the new government to reconsider its foreign policy position as soon as possible, at which tomorrow we're going to discuss about establishing the new working groups for the foreign policy. So it's just only the secret that I can share here. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And our lovely panel, I'm sure uh, you have heard a lot from them and are very hopeful for all these recommendations. So uh, finally, I would like to invite Kun Puthani Gangan, Director of the Fort and Chair of MSC International Thailand, for our closing remarks of this event. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I would not hold you any longer because I know that you are waiting for the informal discussion with the great speakers over here. So, but um, I just have few words uh, talking uh, to you. Um, as the activists who have been working uh, to advocate for refugees for years, I have learned that uh, the Thai authorities have uh, attempted to improve the situation of refugees. Um, in, in many ways, like as you hear of about the alternative to detention on the national screening mechanisms, you hear about the anti-torture acts, like what the speaker already said. Unfortunately, these efforts have been undermined by the poor design. 
or the lack of proper implementation where you already heard from, from our colleagues. As such, refugees' rights have been violated day by day. So every day you still see that there are still be other violations of their rights. And including the arbitrary and indefinite detentions of refugees in the immigration det detention centers that we hear today. So as we know, there are domestic and international principles to guarantee the right to liberties. But we know that the refugees have been deprived of this right. Um, however, beyond all these principles, we just need to start to think from the very simple notions. How does a person who has fled their land fearing persecution end up behind bars, treated like a criminals? How can this happen? Mahatma Gandhi said, the true measures of any society can, can be measured in how it treats its most vulnerable members. So on this, I think there must be something really wrong in Thailand anymore. I call upon all of you here, everyone here, to try your best under your capacity to end the detention of refugees in Thailand. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this will form this will be the end of our panel discussion today. And later on uh, tonight, we will have another film screening. So uh, in case you missed the earlier film screening in the beginning, we will, we, will, uh, we will show the film again if you're interested in watching. Other than that, have a nice evening. Thank you for coming to our event today. My name is Amadi. I'm gay. Parents don't support me. I don't have LGBTIQ plus community support either. This is my first trip to Thailand and it is not for a holiday. In Pakistan, Palestine, Syria, Somalia, Nigeria, Uganda, Sri Lanka, Iran, Iraq, Myanmar and Egypt. Same sex sexual practices and relationships are still criminalized. Many LGBTIQ plus people escape to Thailand in the hopes of finding a new life. I can't go home. I could be killed. LGBTIQ plus refugees in Bangkok experience continuous threats of violence, isolation, and discrimination.
the constant fear of being arrested and sent to an immigration detention center prevents many from leaving the house. LGBTIQ plus refugees are at great risk during detention. Detainees are searched without consideration to their gender identity. Transgender refugees are detained in cells that are not appropriate for their gender identity and puts them at risk. Therapies, 